It's kind of an exciting day, uh, and two, a, 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 a day that uh, we really need to bring a, a message that I hope that this message that I bring this morning um, will be taken in the right light. Amen. Uh, I've probably, uh, it's been a long time, I'll be uh, honest with you guys, it's been a long time, I don't think I've been so nervous to deliver a message uh, as I am today. And so I just want to ask that you would be with us. And, then, and I just really want to ask your permission first before we'll have another short prayer here. But I want to ask your permission of, of everybody this morning. If you would allow me, at least I hope that, that I'll be here for a long time for, for, you know, for God's grace and his love. If you would allow me, I hope to be here pastoring for, uh, for many years. And, uh, but I wanted to see that, that you would allow me then to be your pastor. Amen. And that the words that I speak, that you'll not take them from me personally, but uh, you'll take them from the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we're just so grateful again, Lord God, that you are with us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Lord God, for uh, our brothers and sisters that are here today to worship you. We thank you, Lord, for, the, uh, for these men, Lord God, who have decided to dedicate their lives to you and want to re rebaptize. And just we ask, Lord Jesus, that your spirit would be with all of us, Lord God, and that through this message this morning, Lord, that we would be touched and that we could bring healing uh, to all of us, Lord God, in our homes and here in our church. And so we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would help us, that we could live the lives that would bring glory and honor to you and to the great sacrifice that you have made for us. Again, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. And so we're going to read, and I, uh, I'm looking at this, and I don't know if you could see this, uh, if you can uh, come out. All right, thank you, my brother. Appreciate that that we here, we're looking at this, and if we look at this in our scripture, right, and it, where if you want to, you can open your Bibles. Um, we're going to be focusing mainly in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 through 32. Uh, but I really wanted to start off with this very first verse here in Ephesians 4, uh, 32. And so we're going to read this together, and it comes up here and it says, Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. So we want to see that, first of all, that, that when we talk about uh, our relationship with each other as brother and sisters of the faith, that when we look at this, that we want to see that first it's in the home and then it's brought here into the church. And God's saying, he's asking us because this is written in the book of what? Ephesians. And so what does that mean? That this was inspired by God. Amen. So, so we're reading God's word, isn't it? This is God's word to us. And God is saying, I want you. To be what? What else? And forgive me. I wonder how hard that is for us. He says, for Christ's sake, because of his sacrifice, because of his love, and because of his mercy, I have forgiven you. Each one of us here today, we're here today only because of the mercy and love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. And he says, because of that, I want you then, to be kind to one another, be tender-hearted, and to be forgiving. And it's hard. 
It's hard for our human hearts to be softened for one another, I think. Or at least sometimes I, I get that impression. And, uh, and Jesus says, but that's not the way it's to be. I want you to love one another. And we look and it says, so in James, it's James 5, 16, he tells us, he says, then I want you then to confess your faults one to another. And I get that and I hear that. Sometimes we say it's hard to forgive my brother or my sister unless they're willing to confess their sins, unless they're willing to say what, is, what, is, uh, what have they done. But I want you to think about this as we look at this verse, as we look at this, as, at this, at this topic this morning. I want you to think about it in connection or in conjunction with the book of Matthew chapter 18. Matthew, and it tells us what we have to live our relationship with one another. And some of you are maybe familiar with that, that verse, at least where I'm alluding to, and maybe some of us aren't. But I'll just kind of give you the gist of it, and it says that if your brother has sinned, go to him and talk to him that you might win him over. Then he says, then if not, take two or more with you as a witness. And then bring him before the church. It's unfortunate, though, that sometimes we don't follow that counsel. We don't follow the word of God. And we are hurt, and we hurt each other occasionally, sometimes on purpose and sometimes uh, inadvertently. Sometimes we... We might do something by accident, I don't know, and sometimes it might not have been. But instead of going to my brother and sister and asking them and saying, you know what, I have felt hurt. I felt that you have done this to me, and I want to talk about this. I want to pray about this. We don't. We hide it in our hearts, and we let it fester. And we let it go. We let it go for months, weeks, sometimes years. And then it comes to the point with other things come into our lives and we let those things fester and then at the end these things blow up. And then we want those persons that are guilty to confess their sins. But I want to ask this morning as we read here in James and it says confess your faults one another so we should. And if we felt that we have sinned against somebody we should go seek them out. Sometimes it's the person that is hurt though that needs to seek the other person first. So my question is, sometimes as we're clamoring and we're calling and we're saying that, you know, so-and-so, my brother or my sister, needs to confess first. They need to confess before I can forgive them. I'm wondering how many of us then have taken that step in saying then that we should pray for one another that they may be healed. Do we take that first step and approach this person and say, you know, my brother, I love you. Put your arm around them and say, you know, let us pray. And then talk the situation over. Do we look? Are we taking? Are we willing to really show that first love? Oops. And here in this quote, it says then, the scripture says that Christ, right, says of Christ that grace was poured onto his lips that he might know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. Isaiah, right, helps us with that. And it says, and the Lord bid us, let our speech be always with grace, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Our words should be words of, of grace. Our words should be words that bring comfort. Our words should be words that build up and not tear down. Our words should be words that say that I truly have your best interest at heart. I truly have your salvation at heart. It says the Lord calls for a decided reformation. It says that when a soul truly is reconverted, it says let him be rebaptized. And so I'm asking, I'm saying that we have two men that's come to us. And, I, you know, he came to me, but he's really coming to us because it takes all of us as a family to, to receive everyone, doesn't it? 
and that we saying that these guys have come to us and they said that they feel that they have been reconverted and they wanted to be rebaptized. Now, my brothers and sisters, I'll be honest with you. I've been haven't been doing this very long, well, about 20 years. And I know other pastors have been doing it. By my age, they've already been doing it for 40 years. All right, so I'm still behind. Right, I'm still behind. I was kind of old when I got into ministry. I was almost 40 when I started this, and other folks started in their 20s. But I look at this, and I say that, you know, in all of this time, I still can't read my brother's heart and his mind. I really can't judge if they've been truly reconverted or not. I just have to take their word for it. Amen? I can't just judge their motive and say, I don't know, brother, you have something to prove to me first before I can rebaptize you. You've come to the church and said, I need to be rebaptized. I, you know, and I think that has to only come from the Lord, amen? That, 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 that pushing, that, that had to come from Jesus. And to say that, to, to at least say that I need to be rebaptized. I have to overcome. I have to be forgiven of my sins and my shortcomings. And it says here then, so let them be rebaptized. Let them renew their covenant with, with, with whom? They have to renew their covenant with God. Now we are God's instrument here on earth. But it is God that's who's first and foremost. It is God that is, brings each and every one of us to the point of our lives where we're at today. And he says, then let them renew their covenant with God, and God will renew his covenant with them. He says, my brethren, show true repentance for the departure from God. So we're asking them that, right? We're asking them that then they would show the, the true fruit of the Spirit of God, the true fruit of repentance, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now here's the situation with us. I think it's the situation with all of us, including, including myself. How many of us here this morning can say that I show the fruit of the Holy Spirit 24 hours a day, seven days of the week. Uh, how many of us are here? No, not one, right? Is that Romans tells us? We all fall short of the glory of God. Amen. And it says here, though, but so we're going to ask our brothers and sisters then, as we bring them into the family of God, if they ask to be rebaptized and say, okay, we can't read your hearts, but we're going to take it. For your word that you are repentant, that you are sorry, and that you want to walk in you and God. And that you will show then the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? But I want to admonish that all of us would take that step too and say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me my shortcomings. Forgive me because I too fall in the short of the grace of God. And I too need to walk in the Spirit of God. And I too need to show the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And if I haven't been showing that, forgive me and help me to overcome. He says, God's forgiveness is not just a, merely a judicial act by which he sets us free from condemnation. It is not only forgiveness for sin, he says, but it is what? Reclaiming. Reclaiming. What's that? From sin. Right? And we talked about this. We had our little class on discipleship. And in that class, we look at the scripture. And scripture says that we all have a ministry of reconciliation. And God is trying to reclaim these, sin, these souls from their sin. He said, it is the outflow of the redeeming love that transformed the heart. It's only the love of Jesus that we can see in our lives, that we can repent. He said, David had the true conception of forgiveness when he prayed. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Right? Psalms 51.10. And again he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgression from us. And I don't know about you guys, but do you guys remember that story, that 51st Psalm? Does anybody know what was happening in that story? Yeah. It was David, right? David had committed a grave sin. Or I'm going to say grave sins. Right? How many remember? What were a couple of those sins that he had committed? Murder. David had committed murder. 
adultery, right? We're going to say he was conniving too, wasn't he? He was sneaky because he had wrote orders and he made his general with his own orders go out uh, to the battlefield to be killed. He had a multitude of sins. But it was really interesting to me when I read this and I was looking at this note, right, uh, here out of, of this one. And that David, though, and David, uh, when he wrote, it was that because the prophet had spoke to David and, and basically the prophet told David, you know what? You think you're pretty sneaky. You think you're hiding your sins. Uh, there's some folks that are out there that might know about your sin. Their nature's not willing to confront you, but... God knows. And I'm here to point it out to you. I'm here to let you know. And so David said, right, forgive me. Create in me a clean heart. So we're going to take it for, for, for what it's worth to saying that our brothers are saying that too, saying, look, I want God to create a clean heart in me this morning. I want God to work in my life. I want to set things aright. And it says, the religion of Christ remains more than the, right, means more than just the forgiveness of sin. It means that sin is taken away and that the vacuum is filled with the Spirit. It means that the mind is divinely illuminated, that the heart is emptied of self and filled with the presence of Christ. When this work is done for church members, then the church will be a living, working church. And so I'm saying is that we need all of this. All of us need this every single day, right? And we want to focus this morning maybe on these two fellows that want to bring their life of new to God. They want to say, Lord, create in me a new heart. We have to take the sin out of our hearts and let it be refilled and let that vacuum be filled with Christ's light, with his divinity, with his love and with his mercy. But the thing is that we're in that same boat every day, aren't we? Every day we need to come to Jesus and say, Lord, forgive me because I have sinned. And help me, and you really remove that sin out of my heart and replace it with the love of Jesus in my heart. That I can live the life that will reflect Jesus Christ to others. It says... And again, we're going to read that same verse, and this is, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as, Christ, as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. He says, We who are unforgiving, why, right, cuts off the very channel through which alone we can receive mercies from God. We should not think that unless those who have injured us confess their wrongs, that we are justified in withholding from them our forgiveness. That's hard, isn't it? That goes contrary to our thinking, doesn't it? It says here that the unforgiving, that we will be, if we have an unforgiving spirit, that very channel of mercy that we want from God to be cut off from us, that we should not think that unless those who have injured us confess their wrongs, that we are justified in withholding from them our forgiveness. It is their part, no doubt, to humble their, what? Their hearts by repentance. It's up to them, right? They have to do that. They should be doing it. God expects that of them. He says, to humble themselves. He says, and to confess, but... We probably need to circle that one, right? Highlight it, underline it. It says, we are not to have a spirit, of, uh, a spirit of compassion toward those who have trespassed against us, whether or not they confess their faults. Whoever, however sorely they may have wounded us, we are not to cherish our grievances and sympathize with ourselves over our injuries. But as we hope to be pardoned of our offenses against God, we are to be pardoned all who have done evil to us. That's the beginning part, isn't it? That's part of this is that we all have to learn to have that spirit. That we cannot live as a church. We cannot truly call each other brother and sister. 
I, and I have that habit, right? Uh, because I don't know if you notice that I like to call everybody a brother or sister because we're really, uh, we are supposed to be what? Family. And whose family? God's family. So I'm going to ask that question. So do we have a higher standard as God's family than the family on earth? Yeah. And, uh, and we've talked about this. I, you know, and I've, I've had to kind of do a, a sermon similar to this, and it's just always in my mind. Each church, each congregation, I want to just see that. Each congregation is just a little bit different than the other. Amen? Do you guys believe that? Each congregation has its own little personalities. That's what I've noticed. And each family, and each church, each congregation is its own little family. For example, here, for example, here in North Vernon, this is the North Vernon. This is God's family in North Vernon. And God's family in North Vernon is a little bit than God's family in Columbus or in Colorado, Colorado Springs, or in Dulcera, California. Right? Each family is just a little bit different than, than Elk City, Oklahoma. But no, they're, we're the family of God nonetheless. And just like the family on earth, each family is a little bit different. My family, my little group, my kids and ourselves, we're a little bit different than my sister's uh, family or my other brother's family. But yet, in part of our differences... We talk about being family and we still try to communicate with each other and love each other and forgive each other. And I'm just wondering how more important, how much more higher is that calling in God's family than it is in our earthly family? How many of us have not been hurt by one of our siblings and found it in our lives to forgive them and help them out? Amen? Amen. How much higher is the standard in God's family? How much higher is not that calling to forgive, no matter how strained it might become? It says, in all of your transactions with your fellow men, never forget that you are dealing with God's property. Be kind, right? Be pitiful. Be courteous. Respect God's purchased possession. Treat one another with tenderness and courtesy. And I'm going to ask my brothers and sisters, my two brothers, if you start preparing. As we go forth, we can have a, maybe a deacon with them to help them out, if need be. And we look at this. And I want to look at these things, and it continues to say in our notes, it says that if you have enmity or suspicion, envy, and jealousy in your hearts. You have a work to do to make these things right. Confess your sins. Come into harmony with your brethren. Speak well of them. Throw out no unfavorable hints. Now this is tough for us. This is tough for us, humanly speaking. It says here to throw out no unfavorable hints. To suggest that they will awaken distrust in the minds of others. Guard their reputation as sacredly as you would have them guard yours. Love them as you would be loved of Jesus. In other words, it's saying that we don't want to have ill words, right? We talked about it. It's to speak no words that are evil. Speak no wrong of your brothers and sisters, but lift them up. And if you, you know, there used to be an old saying when I was growing up. I don't know if it's still around anymore, but they used to say, if you, can't, if you, have, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say it at all. Amen? Amen. And that's, and that's, and that's tough for us. It's tough. We, don't, we, are, we gravitate more to speaking evil about other people than we do lifting them up and praising their good uh, they're good points, they're good qualities. We like to point out the wrong instead of the, the good. We focus on that instead of focusing on the right. There's a saying amongst uh, some of the younger people, and I don't know, you might not have, you might have heard this, you might know that, and I've said, I know I've said it before, but there's a saying that some of the young folks like to say, and they say, 
Uh, you know, when somebody else kind of gets in trouble, they say, oh, man, did you hear that? They threw him under the bus. How many of you heard that saying? Oh, amen, amen. You guys know what that means. And so, you know, and, and in focus with today's sermon and today's feelings, I think that sometimes we all want to have a bus ministry. That bus ministry should be a bus where we call people up on the phone and say, you know what? God has a message for you. God loves you. Jesus loves you. And I want to invite you to get on this bus to go to church. I want you to get on this bus to go to heaven with me. I want you to understand uh, this message that God really loves you. But there's some of us, instead of using that phone and inviting people to the heavenly kingdom and inviting people to get on that bus to meet Jesus, we have a ministry of throwing people under the bus. And God has not called us to do that, did he? God has not given us that ministry of throwing our brothers and sisters under the bus. He's called us to have a ministry of reconciliation. He's called us to have a ministry to call and to reach out to our brothers and sisters that they may know their error and hopefully that they'll be understanding of that, that we can reach out with them in love and mercy and kindness and in prayer and in hug and then invite them to come back to Jesus right he says that we will not throw out unfavorable hints no suggestions that will awaken distrust in the minds of others it says guard their reputation as sacredly as you would have them guard yours and it says here that word to me was interesting it says to guard your other your brothers and sisters reputation sacredly what does that mean, sacred? What does it mean to be sacred, to hold something sacred? Now, we're sitting here today, so is the Sabbath day sacred? Yes, amen. Is our tithe and offering sacred? Yes. Is our relationship with Jesus Christ sacred? Yes. And it says then our reputation of our brothers and sisters are sacred as well. That we would not use that phone to put people down, to not comment about our brothers and sisters in a negative way. If, we wanna, if you want to get on the phone, talk about somebody, that, that's fine. Talk about them, but talk about the good points, right? Talk about them and say, oh, man, did you see him? I was so excited to see my brother and sister at church today. Amen? Oh, I was so excited to see them. Did you see how they were, they were walking, my, my brother and his wife? They were walking up to church together. You know, look at the positive things and lift them up. And don't talk to them. Oh, man, did you see how late he was today? Right. Oh, you see that funny-looking shirt he was wearing? Right. We have to be careful. Guide each other. If the angel of God, this is, it, this is interesting now, if the angels of God rejoice over the airing who see and confess their wrongs and return to the fellowship of their brethren, how much more should the followers of Christ, who are themselves erring and in who in every day need the forgiveness of God and of their brethren, feel joy over the return of a brother or a sister who has been what? Deceived by the sophistries of Satan and has been taken a wrong course and has suffered because of that. You see, when people come and they say, I need to be rebaptized, re they realize that they have been walking in the wrong path. And they want to, in their way, it might not be our way, it might not be to our standards, but in their way they're saying that I have been convicted that I have been wrong and I need to set my life straight. I need to set my life right again with my Lord and Savior, and I need to renew that covenant with him. And it says that angels in heaven are excited about that. It says that the angels in heaven are filled with joy. And the question then comes in, then how much more than should we here on earth be just as excited as people 
deciding to come back to God. How can we see this? How can we see that and, see, and be joyful and say, and bring them in and say, God, I am excited that they have recognized their sin. Like I said, it might not be to my standards. And I might be to my liking, right? But scripture also says, judge ye not, right? For by what, how you judge, you will be judged as well. And so we have to be careful. And it says here, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And this is a good stuff. Boy, I've just seen this. And it says here, and he loves, and that's Satan, right? And he loves to have you help him. So whenever we're on that phone and we're talking bad about somebody, what are we doing? We're helping Satan, aren't we? We're not doing Christ's work anymore. We're not doing the work of the church. We're not doing the work of God. We're doing the work of the enemy. And he says, did you help them? But, but disappoint him and do not let him triumph over you. Do not let the devil overcome you. I said, that's, that's easy, right? It's easier for us to talk about others. And this is our last one. This is our last uh, quote for this sermon. It says, we have something to do. We must confess our sins and humble our hearts before God. He made heartbroken confessions. He's talking about a brother. This is a quote, something that happened in a meeting where Ellen White was at. He said that he had made a heartfelt confession and then stepped up to several other brethren, one after another, and extended his hand of asking for forgiveness. Those from whom he had spoken sprang to their feet and making confession and asking for forgiveness, and they fell upon one another's necks, weeping, the spirit of confession spread throughout the entire congregation, and it was a Pentecostal season. God's praises were sung, and far into the night, in nearly morning, and the work was carried on. This was interesting, this last part. He said, when, when the brothers and sisters learned to love each other, to confess, and to love one another, and to forgive one another, he said that then there was a Pentecostal, what? Season. Well, what does that mean? When you guys read the Bible and it was a Pentecostal time in the New Testament book, what does that mean? What was happening there? The Holy Spirit was upon them, and why was that? Was that? All the people were one accord. They came together. You remember the apostles? They were fighting with one another. They wanted to see who was going to be greatest in the kingdom of God. Who is number one? And it wasn't until after the crucifixion of Christ when they were up in that, in that upper room praying. And it wasn't just one day, but it was like almost ten days later that they were praying together. They were stuck. Maybe that's what we have to do, don't we? Well, we got to shut these church doors and we'll be stuck together here. For the next 10 days. All right. And then maybe we can learn to love one another and be of one accord so we can have this Pentecostal season that the Holy Spirit can be poured out upon us. Amen. I'm standing here before you guys. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, man. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I do not have the power to make this happen. It's not within me. It's but it's within who? It's between God and each one of us personally, right? How do we want to open our hearts? How, how much are we willing to soften our hearts towards one another? How much are we willing to let go of our hurts, of the past, that we can come to be here this morning? And not just this morning but every single Sabbath. And that's something I say over and over again. My brothers and sisters, if we truly are the family of God, we need to learn to get along and love each other here on this earth. Because if we can't stand each other for a couple hours, 
once a week. We're not going to make it being with each other for all eternity. This is not going to happen. Amen? Amen. We have to. If we can't get along for two, three hours, Sabbath morning, we're not going to make it for all eternity. We have to learn here and now. Amen? I'm going to see my brothers. I don't know if they're ready. You guys can come out. Are they done? Yeah, and if you can find me a robe, and I'll get ready here in a minute, yes. I'd like them to come out first. Now I'm going to ask another favor. I'm going to ask a, a deacon if he could come forward. Deacon. If you can hand one of these out to each person, please. Come on, guys. Yes. To every person. Yes, every person gets one. Amen. Amen. I want to present to you this morning first, uh, Mike. Uh, you know, and like I said, uh, it takes a while to learn the congregation. I've been here for almost, man, time is flying. I've been here almost a year now. And I still, I really don't know everybody. I still don't know everybody well. And, uh, but I've seen Mike. And I, I think Mike has a, uh, a, a small, uh, you know, a humble spirit about him. And we had a situation in our church, and we're not going to get into that here. Where we just, you know, I don't think it's the appropriate place for that. But we had a situation, and, and we talked with Mike. We talked with Mike, and of course, Mike got upset about that. Uh, and, and, that, and those things happen sometimes. You know, things happen in our lives. But as time passed, I was in, I was in prayer for him, uh, saying, Lord, uh, please forgive Mike. Let him be reconciled to you and bring him back uh, to the church. And, and I think that maybe my, my prayer might have been too simplistic. I'll have to confess because I was kind of, you know, hit by saying, well, you know, he needs to confess his wrong. He needs to come. But I'll be honest with you, my prayer hadn't been that. My only prayer had been, Lord, forgive him. You know, Lord, he sinned against you. Weeks passed. And I got to see him and just say, hey, Mike, how you doing? And that was it. He didn't say anything else, right? He just asked, how you doing? Kept praying for him. Then several weeks passed by, and he came, and he met, met me outside, and he said, Pastor, he says, I know I haven't been walking in the Lord, and I need to make it right with God. And I miss the church. I want to be rebaptized. You know, in my, uh, maybe being naive, all I could think was, amen. Thank you, God. But we get a little resistance sometimes. And it's hard, right? It's hard. Like I said, I'm not perfect. I don't have the perfect answers. Uh, but I always remember my conversion. And I'd, I'd simply tell everybody I was a rascal. <laughs> and uh, I needed forgiveness. And maybe I should have, before I got baptized, should have ran to everybody in my past life and asked for forgiveness and confessed my sins to them. But I didn't. And I went ahead and got baptized anyways. And uh, 20 years later, here I am. 40 years later, 30, here I am. And so I don't know, I'm asking today then, uh, on behalf here with, with Mike, uh, just saying this, that he knows that he has sinned against God. He knows that he sinned against some of you here, sitting here this morning. And he wants to be forgiven of those sins. And so I want to ask, if you have been hurt by Mike, if you can find it in your heart 
to forgive him, I want you to come forward and just give him a hug. And that's it. Just come forward and give my hug and say, hey, look, I forgive you. Amen. Amen. Was, did you want to say anything? Are you okay? You're good. All right. My brother David, again, you know, he's been, he's been coming, and uh, we've seen, seen him uh, take a more and more interest. I knew that it was kind of a, a cool reception at first, but he first came, and he would kind of come off and on, and then he's just becoming uh, more and more steadily. And I know that he's had... He's been a member in the past, right, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and he knows of this doctrine. And, uh, and he's been studying, and he's been watching, and he's been, he looked at some of our, our seminar materials, and then he got involved with our, our discipleship training, and we're, and we're trying to read the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And then he too came, and he said, Lord, he said, Pastor, he said, Lord, you know, I want... To renew my covenant with God again. I want to be rebaptized. And again, you know, my first reaction is, brother, you need to prove it. No, that wasn't it. I, <laughs> that wasn't it. My first reaction was, yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I am so excited. For another person to come back. You know, I'm, I'm going to be, can I be honest with you guys? I know we're taking long. I know we're taking long. As I said, but I'm hoping that, you know, like on the day of Pentecost, these pastors did and these preachers, you know, uh, uh, Paul preached into the night and then that young man fell out the window, right? Well, we're not going to keep you that quite that long, but we'll be a little bit longer. But, you know, sometimes pa we pastors and, and others, there are some lay members, some people too, church members, but we work so hard sometimes. You know, to give Bible studies and, and people that, that sometimes they don't show up week after week. And we work with them and we pray with them. And, we, and sometimes, you know, you, you start out five or six, ten, ten Bible studies, twenty Bible studies, and you might finish just one. And then that person is baptized and they're just so excited. And so it's really disappointing. It's hard to see people with that. You know that somebody had worked and labored with that person just to see them leave the church. And so when they do, and then they come back, it's so exciting. You go, yes, there's praises in heaven. The angels are full of joy in heaven. And I said, Lord, how can I not be full of joy? How can I not be excited that my brother has made that decision to follow you? Amen? And then I, I want to invite you then. I want all of us to be here to be just as excited as the angels in heaven are, to see one sinner repent and turn back to God. Amen? Amen. We want, we want this healing process to start with Mike and everybody else. And this is when I ask now my sister if she would be willing to come forward. And this is tough. This is hard. This is not an easy this is not an easy task to do. It's not.
or just come up. If you feel that you've been hurt, just like, like we do, if you feel that you've been hurt by Heather for whatever reason, and maybe I don't know what it is, if you, oh, we just want you to come up and give her a hug. We want you to do that. And we don't want no more of this back talking, no more of using the phones, but we want to what? Sacredly guard the reputation of each person. And if you feel, and, and I just want to say that because we cannot have healing, we cannot move forward unless we feel that in our hearts, that we can truly love one another. And so I'm asking you this morning, if you feel that you've been hurt by Heather in any way, I want you to come forward and give her a hug. Come forward and, and let her know that there is forgiveness in Christ. This is an opportunity to ask, you know, making an appeal. And, and if you don't avail yourselves of this opportunity, I just want to plead with you then, please, if you have anything negative ever again to say, don't say it. Keep it between you and the Lord. Amen? That these things will never be brought up again. That we need to learn to, to lay that forgiveness. Jesus, I know it's hard for us to forget, right? And only God has that power. God says he takes our sins. And he throws them to the depths of the ocean. And then he, he forgets them. And we need to try to do our part. Whatever sin that might have been committed against us, we need to throw that into the depth of the ocean and forgive and go. I, if I should ask Dad to stand and do that. Brother, uh, I just want to ask my brother to also, Bill, if he would stand. And he too, I want to say that maybe, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I'm saying that if he's hurt anybody, if he's hurt anybody, that then that you would go and, uh, and hug him as well. That you would give forgiveness to my brother. That we can really be a family in Christ once and for all. Let's just go forward. If we need to do that. If anybody feel in any kind of way, in any kind of way to go do that, this is the time. This is the place. Anybody else, whatever, for whatever reason, if you've ever felt hurt, you need to give them a hug. Amen. Amen. Sister, if you can bring that. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, Bill. We're not going to go through all of these doctrines this morning again because we're saying that you guys have, have been through all of the studies. You know the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. My biggest uh, thing here in front, of the, in front of the congregation, in front of your church family, I want to ask you, are you willing to accept all of the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Thank you. Are you willing now, from this day forward, 
to give your hearts and your lives completely over to the Spirit of Jesus Christ? Are you willing forward as best as you can, you know, like all of us that we try, to show the fruit of the Holy Spirit the every day of your life? And we do. Okay, with that, we'll invite you to step back and be ready for our baptism. I'll have to take a few minutes to, uh, to change. What I'd like you to do now, those cards that were handed out to you, if you would take those cards, and if there's somebody, even if they're here today, even if you've already given them a hug, but if there's somebody that you need to forgive, I want you to write it. I want you to write their names on that card. I'm not going to take them up. They're not going to be shared publicly, but I want you to write the names of this card. We'll have a little something else special set aside after this baptism. But if you feel that you need to forgive somebody, even if they haven't confessed to you, I want you to write their names, please. Okay? All right. This is my robe. Okay. All right. Thank you. I want you to come. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, because I have one in the trunk of my car. So if you could do that, if you want to get that ready.